Welcome. Thank you, Chair Bueller, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Sarah Gelser. I'm the state senator from Senate District 8, which includes Corvallis, Philomath, Albany, Tangent, Millersburg, and unincorporated areas of Lynn and Benton County. I was asked to come today to provide a little bit of context around the discussion of employment of people with disabilities. Um, this is an issue that has received a lot of attention lately. There are a lot of terms and organizations that are involved, and sometimes they get a little bit confusing uh, and mixed up. So I wanted to, to start by describing a little bit about why this issue is important and what the difference is between different organizations. So the first thing is that this is an information hearing uh, largely about qualified rehabilitation facilities. Qualified rehabilitation facilities are organizations that exist in order to provide employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Some of the work that is provided through QRFs, Qualified Rehabilitation Facilities, is done um, for at or above minimum wage. Uh, it may be done in a, in a community setting where people with disabilities work alongside people that don't have disabilities. In some cases, some of the work that's done in a QRF may be done in a sheltered workshop or in an enclave uh, or in a cohort of people that go out and do work together, all people with disabilities that are, that are supervised. Not all QRFs are sheltered workshops, and not all sheltered workshops are QRFs. Sheltered workshops are organizations that are created solely to employ people with disabilities, and the people without disabilities that are there are employed primarily to supervise or support the people with disabilities that are working in the organization. That is something, that is a definition that is separate and distinct from a QRF, and that is just a really important thing to, to keep in mind that they are not one and the same. One of the reasons that this issue has been receiving a great deal of attention lately is that there are two things that have happened in Oregon over the course of the last two years. The first is that there was a lawsuit that was brought against the state, um, a class action lawsuit on behalf of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who argued that our state employment dollars were disproportionately being used to put people inside sheltered workshops. Again, that's separate distinct from a QRF, but inside sheltered workshops without opportunities to develop skills to work um, in more competitive, less segregated environments. And some of the lead plaintiffs in that case were able to talk about employment that they had previously had in the community and being put back in sheltered workshops and being denied the opportunity to have the supports to seek gainful employment outside of that sheltered place. As that uh, lawsuit is working its way through uh, the court system, System, the federal court ruled that the Olmstead ruling, which had to do with integration in housing and deinstitutionalization, also applies to employment. That a state cannot disproportionately prioritize funding for employment in segregated or sheltered workshops at the expense of supporting people to gain the skills that they need to work in the community alongside non disabled community members at or above the minimum wage for competitive wages. Um, as that was moving through, and the executive branch would tell you it is not related to the lawsuit, but coincidentally, around the same time, there was an executive order on employment that said that uh, Oregon would start focusing more on providing appropriate employment supports for uh, people with disabilities and focusing more on integrated employment for individuals. Part of that focus would be on young people with disabilities of transition age, and transition age is about 16 to 24 starting to develop opportunities and training for these individuals to be able to enter the competitive workplace. One of the rules that came out of that is that you can no longer go directly from school directly into a sheltered workshop without having the opportunity to, um, to look for more um, integrated employment. So that's, that is why we are paying attention. I, my interest in this is multifold. Uh, the first is that I am the parent of a 20-year-old young man who will be 21 this year who experiences intellectual and developmental disabilities. He is an individual that's directly impacted by this executive order. Um, we have sat through meetings with vocational rehabilitation, developmental disabilities, and the school district as we work on creating an employment path for him. And I can tell you as a consumer and a parent, I am deeply grateful 
grateful for this executive order and the new opportunities that it is offering for my son to develop his own skills so that he will hopefully be able to live and work independently in the community despite um, and, and because of the significant needs that he has related to his, related to his disability. The other interest that I have uh, in this issue is that I've served for several years, my term just ended, as a member of an organization called the National Council on Disability. Our members are, and I'm not speaking on behalf of NCD, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, but members of the National Council on Disability are nominated by the President and confirmed by a vote of the U.S. Senate, and our job uh, is to advise the President and Congress and agencies about the implementation of uh, programs and laws related to the advancement of people with disabilities. In 2012, I was part of a subgroup that took up the issue of subminimum wage and employment of people with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. What we were interested in was a, a federal rule that's called 14C that allows organizations that have these certificates to pay people with disabilities less than minimum wage. We came at it with, from the perspective that a minimum wage is a minimum wage. All people deserve the dignity of work, and it does not make sense to pick out a person with a development developmental disability, hold them to what is essentially a higher standard um, by doing these productivity tests and, and pay them less than the minimum wage. Uh, so what we wanted to do was really study the issue. Uh, our team visited seven different states. We visited with sheltered workshops. We visited with supported employment providers that provided employment in the community. We met with people with disabilities that were very young, like my son. Uh, we met with people uh, with disabilities who were nearing retirement age. Uh, we went into sheltered workshops, we went into all sorts of different um, environments to come up with, with a proposal. Uh, one of the things that quickly became clear to us was that um, I'm just going to read from our uh, from our response here. The committee recognized early that any statement of public policy or recommendation to simply eliminate all Section 14C certificates would jeopardize the security of many individuals who are currently involved with the program. The committee thus concluded that a transformation strategy was needed to phase out a policy relic from the 1930s when discrimination was inevitable because service systems were based on a charity model rather than empowerment and self-determination. NCD stands for the principle that no person with a disability should be discriminated against in an employment setting by paying less than the minimum wage available to all other citizens. And I would take that a step further that um, we also shouldn't be putting people into sheltered workshops. Uh, during our work, and I wanted to share some of this with you, uh, we found some key, key findings about the impact of supported employment at sheltered workshops, outcomes, and cost effectiveness of these different employment strategies. Uh, sheltered workshops are ineffective at transitioning individuals with disabilities to integrate employment. According to the 2001 investigation by the Government Accountability Office into 14C programs, only 5% of sheltered workshop employees ever leave to take a job into the community. So when we take kids at the age of 20, 21, take them out of school and put them into a sheltered workshop, they are likely to stay in that sheltered workshop for the rest of their lives. Just as when we put people into Fairview until we closed Fairview, they were likely to stay at Fairview for the rest of their lives. When they're in these places, they are often not uh, performing tasks that are consistent with their skills or their passions. It is a dead-end job where they are stuck. Um, according to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Medicaid financed pre-vocational pre -vocational services to sheltered workshops are, quote, not an end point, but a time limited service for the purpose of helping someone obtain competitive employment. So the funding that we receive from the federal government is not intended to permanently put somebody into a sheltered, into a sheltered workshop. Individuals in supported employment who had previously been served in sheltered workshop settings do not show a higher rate of employment as compared to those who had gone straight to supported employment without ever being in a sheltered workshop workshop. However, those who had previously been in sheltered workshops had higher support costs and lower wages than comparable individuals who had never been in sheltered workshop settings. We also found that 14C subminimum wage programs are utilized primarily by nonprofit or state operated social service programs and 95% of the workers in these sheltered workshops are being paid less than minimum wage. And research indicates that employees receiving supported employment services generate lower cumulative costs 
than employees receiving sheltered workshop services, and that whereas the cost trend of supported employees shifts downward over time, the opposite is the case for people that are in sheltered workshops. My position is that ultimately there is an economic case to be made for supported employment where we look at the skills and strengths that individuals have, and there's also a human argument to be made for that. It is simply inappropriate to force people into sheltered workshops that are segregated and do not empower people to become more independent. One of the things that's really important to keep in mind in this conversation, however, is that organizations that are offering sheltered workshops are organizations that just 20 and 30 years ago were very progressive, cutting edge organizations serving people with disabilities. These are great organizations and great people who have been working really hard on behalf of people with disabilities. The job that we have now as we have a new generation of people um, coming of age with intellectual and developmental disabilities, this group of people has a different expectation for their future. They expect to be able to make their own choices. They expect to be able to choose whether or not they want to get married. They expect to be able to choose what type of job they want to have and where they want to work. And they expect that they will be treated as equals with all of the other adults in their community. So that if I can expect to earn minimum wage in a job, a person with Down syndrome can also expect to earn minimum wage in that job. Our job is to seek that transition moving forward. Um, you'll hear a lot of conversation today about how we can make sure that uh, these organizations are, uh, are performing in the best interest of individuals with disabilities. I know there's a lot of conversation in this building about the executive order and whether or not that will leave people with disabilities trapped and with nothing to do. As the parent of one of these individuals that does have significant needs, I can tell you I am tremendously grateful for the executive order. And the same arguments that are being made about this transition that we're making employment are the exact same arguments that were made when we closed Fairview. And if you go back and you talk to any person, any person, that lived at Fairview, they will tell you how much they treasure their freedom, how much they treasure their independence, and how much they never want to go back to a place where they lived under the watchful eye of guards that did not allow them to choose what they ate when they got up in the morning, what the temperature of their shower was, or what they could wear when they got dressed every day. This is essentially a civil rights issue that's about whether or not every single one of us is equal, every single one of us should have the opportunity to pursue our passion, or whether we choose to say there are some people that we're going to put aside in a place that's hidden, we're going to pay them less than anyone else, and we're not going to really focus on their strengths. For me, it's deeply personal because I look at my son, I know that he's equal, I know that he has deep capacity, I treat him the same as I do my siblings, and I expect the state of Oregon to treat him in the same way they do all of their other citizens. So I'm grateful you're having this conversation, um, and I hope as we move forward we can all work to make sure that we um, underscore the dignity and rights of all people including those with developmental and intellectual disabilities, and that we can make this critical transition in employment, recognizing the federal court ruling that non-discrimination and segregation or desegregation mandates apply to employment in the same way as they do to housing. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Rep or Senator. Representative Nierman. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair Fagan. So thanks for your testimony, uh, uh, Senator Gelser. Um, I, I share some of your passion on, on uh, these issues, too. I've been to um, QRFs, and I, I know the difference between a sheltered workshop and a QRF, <laughs> and, I, and I appreciate that. I, I, didn't, I was not born with that knowledge, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I did get that. Um, one, of, one of the things um, you know, that's coming up, we're, uh, we're all uh, sitting on the edge of our seats waiting to have the minimum wage debate, and one of the things that, that I hear about the minimum wage is that it's going to cause unemployment. And um, I would just throw out to you just the idea of that when you have people that are not the the leading cutting edge we have developmentally dis disabled people they're uh, they're not the cutting edge of the employable people isn't uh, raising the minimum wage isn't that going to take a bite out of their opportunities for employment uh, Chair Fagan, Representative Nierman, I believe that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are much like people without intellectual and developmental disabilities. Some are going to be very strong workers that are very competitive uh, in the work environment, and some are going to need some more, some more help and encouragement. I do support an increase in the minimum wage. I also support making sure that we aren't paying people pennies an hour. In this state, Goodwill, for instance, pays people pennies an hour while their CEO makes um, is the highest paid nonprofit person in the country and we all well I don't because my family's not allowed to shop there uh, <laughs> give things to them to make that profit off the backs of people with disabilities so I think we absolutely have to change that 
Can I follow? Yes. Thanks. I, and I, I share your uh, outrage, if I can use that word, at Goodwill. And this, uh, I, I have the same issue with some of the other QRFs that I've had experience with, that um, who gets to decide what the what the pay grade is worth or whatever. And, and I, I share your outrage at, at some of that that I've seen. When you talk about the uh, sheltered workshops, I, I, I think there's the same kind of issue there. I, I, I'm in agreement with you that what this is really is about, it's about human dignity. That's what we're talking about. And we need to maximize that for these people, especially these people. And um, um, uh, I, I worry that the reason that we have sheltered workshops is because we have people that are so di so disabled that they're not able to do that. And the sheltered workshop is their freedom. That is their promised land that they go to. And if you were to take that away, they're not going to be able to go to a, you know, a, in an open market, a QRF. And so, um, uh, I, I worry that if you take away the sheltered workshop, the guy who c who can't go into the open market and get a job, get even as in a QRF, is going to end up being put into a less freedom situation of having to be at home and not have the dignity of have having even that job in a sheltered workshop. What would you say to that? I'm um, Chair Fagan, Representative Nierman. First of all, thank you for for bringing up that point. It's a very important one. <laughs> in in this conversation. I think one of the places that we get hung up is getting um, kind of mixed up between different service elements that might be available to support individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Employment is employment. I, and, and I believe that when we're spending employment dollars, state public employment dollars, those should be used in the most cost-effective and evidence-based way to develop job skills for people so that they can go to work. That does not mean that we should be getting rid of day habilitation programs or respite programs programs or day activity programs. It's very, very important that individuals have things to do during the day that are that are meaningful to them, that give them an opportunity to be engaged in the community and with other people. It's one of the reasons why I serve on the um, governor's um, executive order policy task force. One of the things many of us have asked for is that we keep track of not just the number of people uh, that we're increasing that are in supported employment, but we also want to keep track of who's not getting served any, anymore. We want to make sure we're not leaving anybody at home. And we've seen success at this. Vermont, for instance, is operating no 14C certificates and no sheltered workshops at all in the state of Vermont. And their individuals are being served. They are not sitting at home all day staring at a wall. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much, Senator. And uh, Madam Chair, may I make one more point yes. because I would be remiss. I think one of the things that's important on that minimum wage question to keep in mind is that for many of these QRFs, they're nonprofits. So when I talk about a transition, we have to be working with these organizations to be able to continue serving uh, the individuals that they're sharing because you're looking at having to go out and fundraise a bunch of money to make up, make up for that. One of the ways that I've proposed that, it's in Senate Bill 555, would look at the first step, making sure that when we as public entities are purchasing services from a QRF that all of the individuals working on those products or pro products or projects are making at least the minimum wage but rather than putting that fiscal burden on these nonprofits who are working very hard to serve these individuals and have been great advocates for people with disabilities we put that burden back on ourselves in that negotiation of those contracts that those those increased wages would be there and that is a really important thing for me the um, the issue of human dignity and the right to a minimum wage and the right to integrated employment is absolute. How we get there is a transition and being respectful of all of the people that are engaged and have been engaged in this work for several decades is really important. There are no bad guys in this. You just have a lot of people working to support individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and advocate for them and that's something that's really special about Oregon is the way that everybody works together in, in the community to do that and I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you.